I hate the myth of Hemingway. It obscures the man. His talent is stunning. He went against the grain. It's hard to imagine a writer who hasn't been influenced by him. In order to have something new to write, he had to have something new to live. And he fell in love quite a few times. He's complex and deeply flawed, but there he is. Hemingway, the man, is much more interesting than the myth. Hemingway, only on PBS. Hello, I'm Heather Marie Montia, Library Bureau Chief of PBS Books, and welcome. Tonight, I have the privilege of hosting a Detroit Public Television discussion on the writing and legacy of Ernest Hemingway. But first, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge our partners in tonight's event, the University of Michigan, Flint, and the Kama Bookstore and Social Hub, also in Flint. We wanna sincerely thank them for their cooperation and support We'd also like to thank you this evening for joining us. Last week, much of America was riveted to their television screens as they watched Hemingway, the latest documentary from the team of Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. It told the complex saga of the author stripping away the myths surrounding him and revealing the troubled and ultimately tragic person hidden from public view. It was an amazing six hour journey and it made many of us rethink and reinterpret how we felt about the work and the influence of this American master. Especially as we view through the lens of gender, race and other sensitive issues we still grapple with today. Hemingway's first important work of fiction were the Nick Adams stories which were set in Michigan, I'm sure you know. They were published nearly 100 years ago. Much has changed since then, but also much has not. To these stories and the other works of Hemingway, they were revolutionary at their time. Do they still speak to us today? And if so, what do they say? Have they changed in a meaningful way the stories that we American tell ourselves? To tackle these questions, we've put together a remarkable panel of writers, editors, and scholars with whom I would like to introduce. First is Fred Saboda, professor of English at the University of Michigan Flint, one of our partners tonight. He has written and edited books on The Sun Also Rises, The Garden of Eden, Hemingway's short fiction and the role of Northern Michigan. He is also the former director and treasurer of the Ernest Hemingway Foundation. Mark Dudley, professor of English at North Carolina State University, author of Hemingway, Race and Art, Bloodlines and Color Lines and Understanding James Baldwin. Monica Rico, poet, editor, and newly appointed program manager of the University of Michigan's Bear, Writer, Bear River Writers Conference. Congratulations, Monica. And last but certainly not least, Keith Hood, writer, photographer, and former editor of the Orchid Literary Review. Welcome to all of you. So to start, I would love to start with Fred. I'd like to start with you and, you know, I feel like you've really immersed your life. You've immersed so much of your life in studying and writing about Ernest Hemingway. Um, you, much of your career, that's what you focused on. Can you start by telling us what drew you to Hemingway? What drew you to him? Well, I first read Hemingway when I was about 18 or 19 uh, in a college course with the person who later became my uh, major professor for my PhD. And I was just blown away because the, I was reading The Sun Also Rises and it seems so much more real and realistic than almost anything that I ever read before. And I was pretty much hooked. Well, I think when we read things when we're younger, we certainly have one perspective. Did you go back and 
that hooked you, but is that really what made you stick with it? Or did you keep on reading it and gain different inter interpretations along the way? Well, there's a lot more to that book than you see the first time through. It's actually pretty subtle, although people tend to think that Hemingway uh, is not subtle. But I thought enough of it that I actually wrote a book about him, how Hemingway wrote that book. Uh, and that gave me a deeper understanding of what he was trying to do. But I'm always interested in his uh, uh, his work. And especially, I was just re-watching the first episode of the uh, Burns Novick uh, documentary. And that's the one that gives you the sense of how he develops as a writer and what makes him the writer that he is. And that's really what I'm most interested in. Clearly, the summers, um, Hemingway spent up in Michigan, and that left an indelible mark on him. What did Michigan um, and those experiences, what do you think that meant to him? Well, I think Hemingway is a person who's in between a lot of different things. Um, that's what makes his career, I mean, the 19th century and the 20th century, uh, but also very civilized Oak Park and probably still pretty civilized northern Michigan. And he actually creates his own northern Michigan out of his experiences in northern Michigan, but also the history of northern Michigan. So there are times that his uh, stories seem to be set back in the 19th century rather than in the in the 20th century. And that's what he called inventing from experience, taking what he knew and making something new and still authentic out of it. And do you feel that his writing drew more people to visit Michigan? It probably did. There's actually a kind of a cottage industry in Michigan, uh, you know, centered on Potoski, which is near near where the family cottage uh, was and still uh, still is. So there's Michigan Hemingway Society that meets there every year. I think right now there's a series online from the people in Walloon uh, Lake. There are people who do Hemingway tours. So one of the International Hemingway Society's uh, conferences uh, took place at, uh, uh, at Bayview, which is a Chautauqua community very near Petoskey. Uh, so I think people continue to be interested. Um, you know, the um, PBS books actually put together an exhibit and Petoskey uh, Library, I know, is a place where you can actually pick up a map of all of the places Hemingway used to hang out. Um, have you ever been on that tour and were you involved in Yeah, that, that tour was done by the Michigan Hemingway Society. There are a lot of uh, uh, historical markers, I think uh, probably uh, around 15 or so. Uh, currently, so you can follow the tour, you can drive the places, you can walk around downtown Petoskey and get a sense of what these places look like. They don't look exactly the same now, uh, especially since the woods have grown up a lot since they were lumbered over uh, during the uh, 19th century. But you can get a, get a very definite sense of what he was seeing, and I think that's one of the appeals. You know, you go to some places and everything has changed. You go to northern Michigan and it has changed a lot. There's a lot less industry in Northern Michigan than there used to be, but a lot of it seems to look the same. At least it looks the same to us. Hemingway spent time in Northern Michigan when he was growing up. How do you think that that experience with his parents influenced him and his writing? Well, I'm thinking. I'm thinking a little bit about this because it's, it's. This is like worth a worth a book's worth of explanation, which I'll try not to do. But I am a professor, so I can run on. Uh, but I think the thing that it did is it gave him this alternative view from the view of Oak Park. You know, so he's spending part of his time in the midst of something very civilized, and he's spending his time in Northern Michigan, uh, where it's still pretty civilized. It's not a complete wilderness. Uh, during his time, but you can get away from civilization. You can go out and, uh, and and go fishing, which is something he always loved to do. You can go and walk down the road in bare feet and nobody will look askance at you. There's a kind of freedom in Northern Michigan that I don't think existed um, in Oak Park, which was pretty straight laced at the time. Well, thank you, Fred. Um, Professor Dudley, Mark, you appear in the Hemingway documentary discussing the ways in which race is depicted in Hemingway's work. 
to us as modern readers, the way he handles ra race is often upsetting. But you've said that those issues are not so cut and dry in his work. Could you expand on that a bit? Yeah, and taking my cue from Fred, I will try to censor myself here just in terms of time because I could say a whole lot about that. But yeah, um, I recommend when I'm teaching this or I'm trying to sort of uh, initiate somebody who's not quite convinced about the merits of Hemingway, if I'm trying to sort of initiate them into the complexity club, I talk about how it's natural to kind of begin in this space where you're seeing things in literal black and white hues, uh, but there's lots of gray spaces in between there. Um, Hemingway, I'll say this, Hemingway is very intentional about everything that he does. And uh, the film does a really good job of this as well in suggesting just how much of a student of history he was. Uh, he's a very curious mind when it came to history, when it came to you know various uh, versions of the arts. Um, and when it comes to his writing, he's also just as thoughtful. Um, so to indict him immediately from some sort of knee-jerk reaction for his usage of race in his texts makes it all too easy. Everything about this guy was complicated. And I think that's one of the through line messages of the film is just how complicated he was. And they talk about it in various other elements and spaces in his life. But when it comes to race, I would suggest, yeah, you start with the easy stuff. The epithets are easy to, to pick out. And, and in some instances, you lose count how many times he's using an epithet. But I'm always asking the question as to, you know, what's the driver here? Uh, what's the catalyst? Why? If he's using the N word repeatedly or he's making some sort of other racial epithet repeatedly in a text, there's got to be a reason for it outside of just pure hostility or some sort of denigration. Um, and when you peel back the layers, you see that there's all kinds of things going on. And if nothing else, is if, if he's not making some bold, what we would consider sort of be to, to be bold proclamations about race, I invite you to at least make an allowance for his asking questions. And I think that makes him all that much more interesting when you realize that there are lots of layers going on there. I, I definitely agree that there are many layers of that onion. And as you peel it away, you see things in a new light. Um, just Mark, if you could continue and expand a little bit more in terms of you know, you talked a little bit about BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, people of color, how they're portrayed in short stories. Do you think that that this reflects prevailing prejudices that maybe existed at the time? Um, could you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So I'll give you one example, and this is sort of my go-to because uh, you know, I'll, I'll center discussions about race in my class um, in this space, and I've done some of this in my writing. Um, I've got a whole series of questions that I ask about the story, The Battler. Uh, and I'll say this about inten intentionality, and, and we'll use this as a model. Um, in that story, he's taking actual history, things that he would have seen in the headlines of his day, history, sort of history in the making. Um, he's taking the story of two white gentlemen, Ad Wolgast, Jack Doyle, two white men in truth and in, in actuality. If you read the headlines, you'll see that. And Hemingway's not, you know, not a slouch when it comes to reporting the facts. I mean, he's got he, he's got experience steeped in reporting. Um, so he takes two white men and he takes those that story, elements of that newsworthy story, and he racializes it and turns one of those gentlemen black. So my question is, why does he do that? Uh, and if you read the story, it's not just a series of denigrating statements or a, a series of epithets that he's using just for effect. I'd make the case that he, he starts there because he knows what his audience is looking for. And when you use something like the N-word, it comes with a whole host of baggage, uh, a, a bunch of baggage unto itself. He's always anticipating where his reader is going or where his reader should be, where he wants his reader to be. Um, so you take... In one word like that word, and it's wholly evocative of all kinds of things. And he tells a story not about denigration, um, but he tells a story about this particular character, that black character, uh, being elevated. 
so when you read that story, uh, you've got two characters in the so-called white hero who turns out to be anything but a white hero. And the black character is emblematic of all the things that I think Hemingway would find admirable in a character. He's the stoic one. He's in control of not only his emotions, but he's in control of narrative. When you read that story from this perspective, all those things become clear. And I like to use that story as a model again of not only Hemingway's intentionality, but also, um, I, I guess, his intentionality when it comes to just talking about big ticket issues like race, not just in this story, but in a series of stories. And you can transpose this to other instances where it, talking about the Nick Adams stories where he's addressing Native American issues. Um, so it's a kind of universal formula that I think works well and at least gets us to the to the point where we're willing to acknowledge a few things and ask questions. Well, thank you for your insights, Mark, um, and especially for discussing the model because I think that helps us to even reframe how we were thinking about it. Monica, the next question is for you. I'm sure you're aware of Hemingway's reputation when it comes to women, not only in his personal life, but also in his fiction. Misogyny is a word we often use, or that is often used. Um, do you feel this is a fair assessment of Hemingway? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, I think it's kind of piggybacking off what Mark said. I think it's easy to think of Hemingway as hating women. And I look at it more as perhaps a misunderstanding. Um, you know, when he was writing, women didn't have as many freedoms as they have now. So to think that he would make these characters and have them be uh, as strong as the men, just it just doesn't happen. Um, even in one of my absolutely favorite stories, uh, The Last Good Country, which I love because it has the younger sister in it. And I get so excited to see her. And she is also not as great as I want her to be, right? Um, she has to sort of kind of become a boy and then she also has to want to marry the man, which is problematic and troubling, and you want to see better in these stories. Um, but yeah, I mean, even in reading uh, A Movable Feast, you get to the end where he's leaving Hadley for his new wife, but he wants you to feel sorry for him as if the decision is harming him more than it is the women, which is just hysterical, to be honest. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> um, it seems that you've obviously found a way to appreciate Hemingway's work. Can you tell us how Hemingway speaks to you personally? Oh, absolutely. So as a poet, we're all very excited about concision in our language and getting across exactly what we, want, what we want to say in the shortest amount of words and making it as perfect as possible and making every single word count. Well, if you want to learn how to do that, you have to study all of the masters, right? And Hemingway is definitely one of those. Um, one of the things that I love about the Nick Adams stories in particular is how he moves the sentence. So that yes, they are these short sentences, but what's fascinating about them is how they grow on each other and they just dig deeper and deeper and then they become layered upon each other. Even though they're short, they're still moving off one another in a way that creates this emotional landscape that is just amazing. There's the last story uh, in, the Nick Adams stories about um, Nick Adams returning and looking for the father. It, the story just destroys me every time I read it. It's just, it's so hard to read. And it's talking about that building, but that building in a familial way, right? So there was the father and then the son, and now the son has a son. And it's just kind of an amazing thing. 
I understand that you've written a poem for Hemingway and about women, and I'm hoping you will read it for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that I think about when I think about Hemingway is how he writes about women. And so when I wanted to write a poem about Hemingway, I wanted to write a poem that talked about a subject that I thought maybe Hemingway didn't know anything about. And so I wrote a poem about menstruation. The beard of Ernest Hemingway and two tablespoons. Hemingway, take me to the woods. I will wear your clothes, lose my hair in a hat, nearly a boy on my way to find brook trout and you can read the words toxic shock syndrome. You ask, what are two tablespoons compared to 227 trench mortar wounds? It's just a little blood that smells like cinnamon and spills beneath me under the pines where you say my eyes match the scales of fish waiting for the shimmer of bacon grease on cast iron, my uterine lining to shed itself and regrow like a beard. No one else will sop up the mess with bread. Monica, thank you for sharing that. Very powerful words and it's just, I love the spoken word, so thank you. And to have that be inspired um, by Hemingway and be able to share it tonight on this stream was wonderful. Thank you. My next question is actually for Keith. I know Keith, you growing up in Detroit in the 60s, your childhood experiences were quite different than that of Nick Adams. But as a writer and a photographer, um, could you discuss that about how your work maybe is based like Hemingway's on a everyday observations? Um, my work is, of, of my published work, uh, only one of the stories takes place in Detroit. But I do have several stories that I'm working on that do take place in, in, in Detroit. And I'm working on a collection of stories that is set in Detroit. Where my childhood experience, I think, comes in more than anything else is um, one of my teachers once asked in a, in a class for us to name three things that we will never forget, three, three things in our life that happen that we will never forget. And one of the three things that I'll never forget was be is that the on one on a Sunday in July the Detroit Tigers were supposed to be playing the, the New York Yankees and my uncle was supposed to be taking us to the game and when my mother woke me up that late later that morning she told me I said is it time to go to the game and she said no 12th Street's burning down come see we lived on Virginia Park Street in Detroit, uh, just a little over a block away from 12th Street. And we walked out, we lived in a two family flat. People outside of Detroit don't know what that is, but it's a duplex with the up and down stairs. And we had a front porch and we went out in that front porch and you could see the smoke and flames from our front porch. Uh, later in the day, I saw parades of looters walking down the street. There were four policemen with rifles on all four corners. By this time, the police had been given do not shoot orders. And people were walking by with looted food, and in some cases, actually feeding the police with sandwiches made from looted food. And so that, and of course, the riot went on for over a week and tons of people died. I had to walk to church past armed guards. Tanks were rolling down our street at night. And that event, even though I never in any of my fiction described myself as experiencing those events, lots of my characters do. 
I've taken my life experience, my experience, and imposed it on people that I invented who have no similarity to me whatsoever, but they kind of have my life experiences. So that's it. Well, thank you for that reflection. Um, I know that Hemingway's stories were in their own time and how they influenced or or not today's more diverse community of writers and readers. Do you, do you think that Nick Adams' stories speak to us today? Um, and do you think those characters and the rest of us that it is, um, you know, after a hundred years that it still is a coming of age story in America? Um, I have mixed feelings about that because I have mixed feeling about the whole idea of coming of age stories. Um, and the, and also coming of age stories have become kind of a trope in film, not talking about fiction, but in film. And that experience is almost always um, white. And if, and when you do have a coming of age story like um, in film, like The Hate You Give or Moonlight, it's always tied to the main character's race and kind of tragic circumstances. And I think that's not true of other of, of, of coming of age stories that um, don't feature people of color. And I sometimes wonder if there's more of a need for coming of age stories of people of color that are not tied in some way to tragic circumstances, poverty and race. Keith, those are some really interesting points. Thank you. Before we continue this conversation, let's take a moment to watch an excerpt from Ken Burns and Lynn Novick's documentary, Hemingway. It deals with what many people feel was the finest novel, Farewell to Arms. And in fact, a little bit of trivia, it is in fact the favorite uh, novel of Ken Burns and Lynn Novick. So can we see the clip? In the novel, Lieutenant Henry deserts and flees to neutral Switzerland with Catherine Barclay. They hope to marry and build a life together once the war is over. She is pregnant. But something goes terribly wrong in the delivery room. Doctors perform a cesarean. The baby is stillborn. Catherine's life ebbs away. Hemingway agonized over the ending, writing 47 versions of the final pages before he was satisfied. I went to the door of the room. You can't come in now, one of the nurses said. Yes, I can, I said. You can't come in yet. You get out, I said, the other one too. But after I had got them out and shut the door and turned off the light, it wasn't any good. It was like saying goodbye to a statue. After a while, I went out and left the hospital and walked back to the hotel in the rain. Parts of A Farewell to Arms could have been written by a woman. Now, I regard that as a compliment. Hemingway might regard it as an insult, but I don't, because it is the androgyny in a man or a woman that allows them, even if briefly, not utterly, to be able to put themselves inside the skin of the opposite thing. In many ways, I think it's his greatest novel. 
I do. It's the truest. It's also heartbreaking. I remember crying and crying and crying. He gets the all the the boy stuff, the man stuff. He gets the horror of the war. But when people put that book down, what do they remember? They remember a woman dying in childbirth. If people bring so much courage to this world, the world has to kill them to break them. So of course, it kills them. The world breaks everyone. And afterward, many are strong at the broken places. But those that will not break, it kills. It kills the very good and the very gentle and the very brave, impartially. If you are none of these, you can be sure it will kill you too. But there will be no special hurry. Wow, what a powerful and moving passage. It certainly is contrary to the ultra masculine myth that shrouds Hemingway. And every time I see this clip or when I read A Farewell to Arms, I can't help but wonder and think to put it in context, to think about the time in which Hemingway wrote that passage. Um, and now I'd like to kind of throw, throw that to the panel for everyone to reflect or for someone to, to start it off with, to discuss how revolutionary Hemingway was in his writing of A Farewell to Harms. Who would like to start? Well, I'll, I'll start since nobody else wants to start. <laughs> uh, nobody wants to be the first, right? Uh, I think the, the, the simplicity uh, of that narration uh, and the control of that narration is is what comes across. And the you know the character doesn't say that he's devastated mm -hmm. by the loss of Catherine in childbirth, but you can feel it. Uh, one of the things I really liked about the documentary, uh, especially in part one, they do a lot of looking at the manuscript pages and recreating Hemingway's process of revision. You see things crossed out. Uh, and canceled and added, uh, and that 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 care that Hemingway took with 42 endings of that novel to get the tone right, even though it seems so simple, I think is a real uh, a real hallmark of what he does. And you can't get the emotion without the craft. No, that's a great, definitely a great point. Um, Mark, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on what Fred just say, said and suggest that uh, I think the ending is absolutely brutal, um, but it's beautiful and it's perfect. And that's the that's the ending that has Bradley Cooper tossing this book out of a window in Silver, Silver Linings Playbook. Um, it's fantastic. It is the least romantic romance that you could pick up. Um, and dovetailing what, what Fred said, um, it is, I think, just remarkable in its cynicism. You got to remember that this is written between two world wars, right? And the first world war of which he was a part, at least for a moment, was supposed to be the war to end all wars. And we were going to do it again some 10 years later or so after this one um, or after this book's publication. Uh, so the cynicism, this book is just rife with it. Uh, it's palpable from the very beginning uh, and you see it perfectly being displayed at the end. Um, but I can't think of a better statement about war than a farewell to arms. Thank you, Mark. So if we can move a little bit to examine that clip in a different way when Edna O'Brien speaks about androgyny and gender fluidity is not something that necessarily would have jumped to mind you know, when I was 16 years old reading Hemingway. But now that we've been able to see parts of the documentary, see the documentary, and maybe also because we're, we're older and looking at it in a new way, um, how have you found that this, this idea of gender fluidity maybe lurked in his work? Well, 
Well, there... I... Yes, perfect. <laughs> Go ahead, Monica. One of just the really smallest things that always stands out to me is the women are always cutting their hair short. Um, and even in his uh, actual real life, his wives were cutting their hair short. And I'm not sure if that is really a gender fluid thing, but maybe perhaps at the time when he was doing it, it was considered maybe a little bit more controversial than it would be now. That's definitely I, a great tie-in, a great point. Let's return to a theme I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation. Does Hemingway and his work speak to us today, particularly to more diverse contemporary audiences? Is this a general question to everybody? It is, all of these are general questions. So maybe, I know Keith hasn't yet thrown his hat in the ring for one of these. So do you wanna start us off and then we'll, we'll have someone else, maybe Doug, uh, Mark? I think I think Hemingway is pertinent to, to to today's readers in the same way that all literature is pertinent to people who enjoy to read, who enjoy reading. Um, I don't think he's any less or more important than other writers of his time, um, Fitzgerald. Um, Steinbeck. Um, also, if you go into the 19th century, uh, writers like uh, Henry James or Jane Austen, um, those are all literature that we appreciate and regardless of the times they reflect or the time in which they were written. Um, Good literature is good literature. Some of it will be more fond of than others. And part of the thing about good literature is that it is timeless. Even though Hemingway's fiction takes place in a different time, um, it's, with some exceptions, it's not dated. Thank you. Mark, do you have something to add? Yeah, I'd suggest a couple of things uh, along the line of, uh, of what Keith just said. Um, he's timeless because he's a great writer. Uh, he's a master craftsman. Um, to that point, I mean, to the, to the question about diversity, diverse audiences, uh, you know, Ernest Gaines, who just passed, suggested um, in an interview a few years ago that when he was starting off as a writer, uh, one of his models was Hemingway in terms of his uh, analysis of how good sentences are constructed. Uh, if you want to know how to build a, a, a construct a great sentence, you look to somebody like Hemingway. That's universal. Um, and as are those themes, you know, the cynicism of our very modern age, you know, take us now into a new century. I'd say we're more cynical now than we've ever been. You know, church attendance is down and, uh, you know, um, there are never ending wars. All those kinds of things are going on. Um, so cynicism is high, but the need for some redemptive uh, valuation of things persists. And Hemingway's writing is all about that, right? Uh, finding value in things for ourselves. Um, and those are those are timeless kinds of themes. So I don't think that, uh, like Keith says, I don't think that it is a matter of color or a matter of diversity. It's just great writing. And there's a lot more in him than you expect. Uh, I had a friend, uh, James Hinkle, who was a World War II infantryman and had a conversation with him once where he said that he had thought at one point that Hemingway simply existed so people like him could go to World War II and survive World War II. But in the years since then, we've learned more and more about Hemingway. But we're also, because we have new kinds of insights, uh, we read Hemingway and we find things in him that we wouldn't have seen before. So the whole uh, emphasis on gender uh, in Hemingway, uh, it took the second wave women's movement to make people see that because we were ready to see it. Uh, you know, and to reduce him is is always a, uh, a problem because he's just amazing. I mean, uh, 
uh, I think it was uh, Keith who mentioned Henry James. Somebody mentioned Henry James. Mm -hmm. and, and while Hemingway looks really different, he's really a version of Henry James. He does a couple of things. One is he renders very, very complex intellectual and emotional states, completely different uh, kind of writing. He's also uh, a great interpreter of the European experience uh, to Americans. And, you know, who would have thought? Hemingway, Henry James, but I think it. No, that's a really wonderful point. Um, one of the things that I know we always struggle with and we like to think about is who are the writers today that will have a similar impact in the 21st century that Hemingway had in the 20th century? And I know we have professors and writers and poets, so we thought this would be a good question for you. I think when when I saw this question, the person who most obviously came to mind for me was Raymond Carver. Mm. Uh, and and then also there are other writers such as um, Dennis Johnson and Tobias Wolf, yeah. who I also think are heirs of Hemingway. And but I, I think I think I would go back to Carver because to me, Carver kind of became the Hemingway of his time and influenced so many writers. Mm -hmm. um, and the, as for today, you know, I've got lots of writers who I love. I'm just not sure how influential they are. I mean, I love Alice Munro, Joyce Carol Oates, Edward P. Jones. There's a lot of contemporary writers I love like Brian Washington. Um, I'm just, time will tell how influential they are. Yeah, if I could just, if I could just uh, add to that and suggest, uh, that's the first thing that popped into, into my mind as well. Um, you know, time is going to be the, the, t the teller here, the true teller. Um, you know, somebody like Phil Clay, who writes about um, uh, being a soldier in, in our time, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, um, you know, 10 years from now, are we going to be talking about that imprint on what it means to be a soldier in America, um, the way we talk about Hemingway and soldiering in the 20th century? I don't know. Um, but yeah, you, to pivot a little bit, that imprint of Hemingway, again, for anybody out there who's cynical and asking questions about the, the lasting power, staying power of Hemingway, uh, we, we see it with contemporary writers who are, are very much enjoying some prominence now who are with us. you know. Um, Somebody like Dennis Johnson, who, who uh, Keith just mentioned. Uh, somebody like Gail Jones, who I read recently uh, is going to be producing a novel after like 20 years of, of absence. And that's sort of uh, germane to our conversation here about things Michigan related. Um, uh, what about Russell Banks, who has a North Carolina connection, sort of close, uh, close to, to my home? Um, stories like affliction that speak to the redemption of uh, the redemptive quality of the human nature in the face of adversity that stuff doesn't go away and the imprint of hemingway is there and as as keith was saying too my first thought when you talk about how how you, you want to sort of construct dialogue correctly you look for that imprint of hemingway and somebody like raymond carver so yeah now carver's a very good uh good parallel also uh older writer at this point, uh, Tim O'Brien, who writes about the Vietnam War, he wrote an entire short story and then short story collection that really becomes a novel called The Things They Carried. And it's about infantrymen in Vietnam in this case. It's about all the stuff that they're toting. And he obviously had read Hemingway's great short story, Big Two-Hearted River, which is set in the Upper Peninsula. And the character there is carrying a huge backpack I actually did a demonstration in class once and, and brought in a backpack with all this stuff in it. And it's about World War I, and it's about PTSD, which, of course, didn't uh, exist as a diagnosis in Hemingway's time. And it's about not just physical burdens, but it's about emotional burdens. And so people like Tim O'Brien take Hemingway they pull things out of them, then they start riffing on it. And they, instead of just taking the Hemingway themes, they make the Hemingway themes uh, their own. And, you know, and uh, Hemingway's themes are uh, things like uh, love, war, wilderness, and loss. I mean, those show up again and again and again in his stories. And as several people have said here, 
they're universally human. They're not involved just with, with one gender, with one race, with one national experience. There's something that everybody faces and the good writers, and I, I'm not gonna look at my crystal ball and say who's gonna be the greatest among contemporary writers because I'll just make a fool of myself. But the great writers will take those themes, and those concerns, and they will run with them. Yeah, one more, one more writer who I'd like to mention. Uh, when when you're mentioning Tim O'Brien and the things we carried, and uh, the focus on writers dealing with war is is Viet Thanh Nguyen, who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning The Sympathizer, a short, uh, excellent short story collection called The Refugees, and his new novel is out now called The Committed. Uh, I have a feeling, and he writes tons of great nonfiction and essays, and I have a feeling that uh, Viet, Viet Thanh Nguyen's novels and short stories are going to stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. He's an outstanding writer. Yeah, yeah speaking of writers that will, out, that will last forever, um, some of the very obvious choices to me are Toni Morrison, um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Isabel Allende, and uh, uh, Julia Alavarez. To me, their novels span histories of cultures and civilizations that are so absolutely essential to all reading lists. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you to all of you for those great recommendations for us. Um, I just want to remind everyone out there that if you have not yet submitted questions, you can submit them in the chat. And shortly after, a few more questions, we'll be asking some of the questions that you've submitted. So please feel free to just put your question in the chat and we'll ask it momentarily. Um, I know all of you last week on the, on the call had time to watch the the documentary and what i'd like to know is if you could share did you have a favorite part um and and what was it i'll i'll go for something easy i'll go for the low-hanging fruit um <laughs> as a scholar i get excited about things undiscovered and seeing some of the some of the raw footage, some of the uh, sort of a home movie kinds of footage, uh, and some of the stills that I hadn't seen before was rev revelatory for me. And how about uh, Sylvia Beach? Um, seeing her was was an absolute joy. Sylvia Beach is wonderful. Mm -hmm. One of the few people that Hemingway revered through his entire life. He never broke up with her. He never uh, had anything terrible to say about her, and vice versa too. I mean, they were just on the same page. I know for me, one of the amazing things in watching the documentary was that there wasn't a lot of video. There's not a lot of videography on Hemingway and how they were able to create a film and, and really create movement throughout. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't seen the documentary yet, when you watch it, think about that because it's pretty neat how the filmmakers were able to create movement um, in the way they were use their cinematography. Anyone else have a thought of what they loved? I, I especially loved the first episode of Hemingway becoming a writer because it focused on Michigan, it focused on his time in Paris, and I just find that the most intriguing period of Hemingway for me personally. And he's writing some of his best stuff too in the first part of his career. And from there on, you know, it's not like he doesn't write great stuff later in his career, but he hits this, this incredible peak so early on that it's just wonderful to watch. And then as you see him with his mental problems, which are mostly, I think, physical problems, uh, you know, the concussions, he also had a disease called hemochromatosis that made a difference in his behavior. And you see him going downhill physically and still struggling to write well and, and often writing very well, even in his late, late in his life. Yeah. Well, I think we are going to jump into some of the questions that people have been writing in. 
So I want to start with, we have a question for all, all of you out there um, on the panel. The question is, if you wanted to suggest a book or a story from Hemingway for a millennial to read, what would that be and why? And I don't know who wants to start, but maybe Keith, do you want to start? Do you have any thoughts? Sure, uh, I'll start. Uh, well, I go to the, for me, actually, the Nick Adams stories, even though there, I, there are tons of them that I do like. I like Indian Camp, um, the, uh, and the doctor and the doctor's wife, but um uh, I think my favorite story, regardless of whether you're a millennial or who you are, will probably always be Hills Like White Elephants, which, which I think is just a fantastic story. I have read it multiple times and I will read it many, many times more. And every time I pick up something new, I, in fact, I recently took a class with uh, David Joss, a teacher some of you may be familiar with. And he just gave me all kinds of new insights into hills like well, hills like white elephants, things I just hadn't seen before. Thank you, Fred. Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean the the early stuff uh, um, in our time. The sun also rises. Harold Arms is all good. Hills like elephants, white elephants is just wonderful. Uh, partly because it sees the female point of view as well, as well as the male. Also because of what it leaves out, which is takes about five or seven minutes to read that short story. The actual time that passes in that story is at least a half an hour, maybe more. And the, the couple who is having a discussion about uh, abortion, although they never use the word abortion as the, as the film mentions, um, they're mostly not talking to each other. They're not communicating. Uh, very well. You also saw that in the uh, uh, the film Up in Michigan, which they said is about a date rape. Uh, and when they talk about it in the uh, uh, in the documentary, but I think it's really about a couple people who really care for each other, but sex is not going well. Hmm. And I'm not sure that everybody's had that experience. But sometimes you're with somebody, you care for somebody, and it's still just not not working. And I think that's very very human. Uh, and so that's another one that I would recommend to people, even though it will be shocking to some people when they start looking at it. Yeah, my recommendation would be a movable feast, but not the restored edition that has his um, kind of like notes that you can read through of what he was going to put in and his drafts and what he wanted to take out. I feel like that, I don't know, that kind of bothered me when I read it again and saw all of that at the end. But just for the sheer adventure of a movable feast and how fun it is to see him out uh, trying to make it on his own in Paris as an American is just really charming. And the gossip uh, with all of the other writers is just, it's hilarious. Now that's a case where, where a good editor, in this case his, his wife, uh, uh, Mary, who was a, a professional journalist before she married him and became a professional Hemingway wife. Uh, the editing of that was just wonderful. Another thing I recommend is The Garden of Eden, yep. which the Scribner's editor named Tom Jenks went into Mr. Scribner's office and was given this huge pile of manuscripts and said, and told, make a novel out of this. And he did. He cut it like mad and cut it like mad and cut it like mad. And the scholars have been angry ever since at all the stuff that he left out of that novel. But it is very interesting because it's it's all of the stuff that Hemingway couldn't have published during his life because it's about androgyny, it's about uh, gender being a kind of a fluid thing. And I found that a lot of women I've talked to have read that novel uh, really appreciate it. Uh, I think in the way that I appreciated The Sun Also Rises getting the the truth about a vulnerable male. Garden of Eden does that. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking that as you as you uh, were talking, Fred. I mean, that was that was going to be my go-to. Uh, a couple of quick things I would suggest. I don't know where, how we're running on time here, but I would I would say what I would stay away from if I was trying to initiate a young person would probably be some of the things that I was um, introduced to uh, early on, which would be a story like um, a clean, well-lighted place, which I love but I wasn't ready for it at say 17 or 18. Um, something like um, The Old Man in the Sea, which I love, 
uh, I wasn't ready for as a freshman in college. I don't think you're ready for us. Uh, I think you, I, I don't think you're ready for stories like that where there is no not a whole lot in terms of plot. Um, my recommended text would be something like The Sun Also Riot Arises, which is as riotously funny. Hemingway can be really funny when he when he wants to be uh, when he's on. Uh, and I would go to a couple of his quasi panned books like the Garden of Eden. As Fred said, uh, there's a lot of contention uh, when it comes to the critics and how it's been received over the years, uh, but it's fascinating. Um, and I would also, and I've been pushing this for some time now, I've been pushing it on my students. I would recommend something like The Have and Have Not, which is a bad book in a lot of ways, but it's funny and it's interesting and it's, it's certainly provocative. Yeah, I would like to see a new version of To Have and Have Not because it's all about the have-nots. And True. when Hemingway wrote it, he wrote it about the haves, too. And his publisher said, you got to cut this stuff because we're going to get sued. Uh, okay. And I read the, the whole manuscript, and it's really a much better novel. And characters who come across poorly in the published version mm -hmm. uh, come across quite well. And they're, they're much more intricate. Um, in the original version, and I suggested to Charles Scribner that they publish the whole thing, and he said, well, we did this different version of Fitzgerald's Tender as the Night, and everybody beat us over the head for that, so we're not going to go there. But maybe the Hemingway family would want to consider that, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are almost at the top of our hour, um, and I just want to thank the, the, the panelists for spending a perfectly good hour with us. Um, the one thing I will say, I don't know if any of the panelists have yet read the new companion book that I have back here, which is the Hemingway stories. And it's nice because it has many of the short stories, but it also has insights from contemporary writers. So if, um, if anyone is looking for a good book, a lot of the authors who are featured in the documentary, um, you can get insights for them. And the filmmakers both mentioned how great the short stories are because they're quick reads and it's a great way to just jump into um, Hemingway. So once again, thank you so much um, for, for your comments, your insights, your wisdom, um, and really um, thank you for your, your, your love and understanding and respect of Hemingway. Um, so at this moment, I actually wanna thank the people at Coma Bookstore, they help to put together um, a reading list, an author list um, of authors of color who are writing coming of age stories, memoirs and other works based on their own realities. You can find this list at dptv.org slash Hemingway. I also want to encourage you, PBS Books also has a book list uh, and you can find that at pbsbooks.org slash Hemingway. You can also find not only the book list, but also we have a virtual exhibit that features um, three different libraries throughout Michigan. So, um, and really cool stuff. Uh, the Clark Historical Library at um, CMU submitted stuff, um, Ionia uh, Community Library and also Petoskey. So definitely check that out and you can see also galley copies and photographs. It's just a lot of fun. So um, I actually, want to say that, you know, there are so many amazing passages in Hemingway that that we haven't been able to necessarily discuss or really um, get, get into. But if you have more questions, submit them and we'll see if we can get them answered, even if we, we write back to you on the Facebook feed. So thank you panelists for a lively, thoughtful conversation, for entertaining us. Um, and thank you for um, our partners. Once again, the University of Michigan, Flint, Coma Bookstore. Um, if you have not yet watched the documentary, you can find it at PBS Books, excuse me, at pbs.org. Um, we also ask that you take a moment to complete the online survey and let us know how you felt about this evening's program. If nothing else, I hope this evening will encourage you to read 
or reread Nick Adams stories, A Farewell to Arms, or any other Ernest Hemingway novel or nonfiction book. So we'd like to thank you for entrusting this journey um, and for being here and for asking thoughtful questions. This is Heather Marie Montilla from Detroit Public Television and PBS Books saying thank you and good night. <laughs>